Hey, welcome back to Discovering Principles for Parenting. This is session two. If you didn't check out session one, be sure to go watch that first. It lays a foundation for this particular session. This is session two of Discovering Principles for Parenting. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and we're going to start to talk about what's next in this particular um, presentation. So session two, let me just uh, review with you. Yeah, those are my kids. Uh, they're wild and crazy back in the day. So funny. I uh, love them so much. And they're now 24, 21, and 16. So they've grown up a little bit. So um, remember, we left off last time talking about how in adolescence, about ages 11 through mid-20s, is when they have this thing we call egocentric abstraction, which literally means, as I said in the last session, that it's one of those things where they uh, they they know what they are doing. They, they are impacting you, but they don't really care. And the reason they don't care, I'm going to go into detail, is because they're in survival mode. They're just trying to get through this thing called adolescence and figure this thing out, and, it, and it's difficult for them. So I talked about how dependence on mom early on, obviously, and then they're fighting for their independence, and then we want them to be interdependent, on the relationship with Jesus and connection to the church. And this is middle and high school and college aged years. So some of the things that are impacting our world, <clears throat> excuse me, that we need to talk about and lean in just a little bit about is obviously sports performance. And you can, you can see from these pictures, obviously athletics uh, looked a little bit different back in the 1800s in that center picture. And, and parents are out of control these days and, Little League championship games are so disappointed when they lose the championship. And and we've we've done a number of things that are really great with sports, but but we've also put all of this pressure on kids to perform in a certain way. And we've that we've uh, measured our love for them based on how well they do, and they feel it. They feel it. So sports is one of those areas. Another area is obviously the family system structure has changed through the years. You know, it used to be a past family. Obviously, there's a mom and a dad, and and uh, the the person, the the child, the adolescent was the me in that picture. And now today, well, with with families uh, getting divorced and remarrying and connecting, and now you have stepsisters and moms, and it gets really complicated really fast. And and this is this is not a comment to shame or judge families today. It's just a it's just a fact. It's just just part of the equation of the way kids grow up and their family system really impacts them quite a bit. God can redeem those things, but it is something we need to pay attention to. It is impacting the way kids are being raised today. The other thing is, is educational expectations is I, I mentioned in the last session that the kids feel like they're being measured by goals and grades and uh, goals being athletics and grades being school and man, the expectations on kids to grow up and figure it out on their own because all these pressures to get into the right college and get the right scholarships and do all the right things and college prep classes and all this. And, and we say that we come alongside of them, but in reality, we kind of want them to figure it out on their own because isn't that part of them growing up, we think. And the reality is I don't blame teachers. My wife's a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. My undergrad is elementary education. I was going to be a teacher. And so I'm all for teachers, but I think they've been given a system that's broken and uh, like standard um, tests, national tests are, are just done in such a way that the expectations that are put on kids are from adults. And sometimes those expectations are really hard to meet developmentally where they are. That doesn't mean we don't raise the bar high. It just means we need to approach these things a little bit differently. So the response of our kids is they're stressed out. <laughs> they don't know what to do. They're stressed out. Over 60% of Gen Z have an anxiety disorder. This is absolutely crazy. And that was last year in October. There have been multiple studies done over the last decade in particular that the next generation's anxiety level, they're lonelier, they're isolated more. And this isn't just because of the pandemic a few years ago. Uh, this is because um, of things that were happening before that. And mainly because of smartphones, it's isolated the next generation. So their anxiety, their stress, they can't cope with it. It's really, really difficult for them. 
So we need to pay attention to this. As a result of all these things, I'm going to give you a number of things that are just true about adolescents, 11 to 20-year-olds in mid-20s, what's going on? Adolescents live in an underground world today. What do I mean? I mean that they're surrounding themselves with the people that support them and have their backs no matter what. That's mainly their friends. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But they are they live in an underground world. In the 1950s, music and movies and dress all looked about the same. The whole youth culture dressed the same, listened to the same music, were all about the same in the 1950s. Just ask anybody who grew up in the 1950s, and it was a true across across the spectrum with the next generation, what was going on. They went to the same diners, they dressed the same way, they listened to the same music. And over time, things started to change. In the 1960s, you got the youth culture that's rising up, the Vietnam War, British invasions, JFK was assassinated. And now they're starting to listen to different kinds of music. They're starting to have different experiences. Now the world they're they're quickly realizing is not perfect. It's messed up. There's wars, there's things happening. The president is assassinated. And so they're digging a trench. And then they start to dig a hole. In the 70s and 80s, there's a separation now of youth from adults. It's widening. I remember being a youth pastor early on and being given my own youth room to decorate, do whatever I want with. That sounded really, really great. I could I could do whatever I wanted with those youth. We could decorate it. We could paint the walls. We could do whatever we wanted to. But indirectly, unintentionally, what we did is separate the next generation from the adult community because they were too disruptive in church. And so we started to, to separate them. We started doing this in schools. We started doing it across the board. And uh, the, there's a widening in community and relationship with adults and youth. And then in the 90s, in the 2000s, adults are, are not trusted anymore. And so a bridge, a ceiling, if you will, is put over the top of this ditch. And uh, now because of the digital world, students are separating themselves from adults more than ever. They are looking down at their phones. They're on different apps and they're on Snapchat, Instagram. It used to be Facebook. That's not cool anymore. Now their parents are on that. Watch Instagram is going to go away for the next generation. It's, it's now turning into TikTok and there will be another app. As soon as you figure it out, there'll be another app that they run to into the underground world to try and separate themselves from adults that they, they really don't trust anymore because Nobody loves them for just them. They love them only based on performance, which is the reason why they've they've dug this to begin with. And so as a result, the digital world is obviously where they're escaping to and and now they're covered over. And you know, now we have, you know, uh, fictional signs about slow children texting uh, because the phones are taking over the world by storm and impacting the next generation. Listen, everybody born, from today to about 10, 11, 12 years old, have known nothing but smartphones. They've not known another world. And this is this is what we need to pay attention to. In 2004, Facebook came into play. And obviously, you look through this list of when these apps and when these companies came into play. And in 2007, 2008, when the smartphone came into existence, we're now any aged person with a smartphone can access anybody else around the world or any sets of groups. And what they do is they tend to gravitate towards people that believe the same things they do, that affirm them in whatever they believe. And so they, they find these groups of people online to affirm them. And it's a little bit scary. We got to pay attention. Another result is adolescents live out multiple selves or identities or avatars. Uh, just recently, I was in a conversation with my mentor, Professor Chap Clark out of Fuller Theological Seminary, and he's done tons of research about this. This is what I talked about in the book Hurt and Hurt 2.0, and when kids hurt in the first session. And now we, we've gone from just multiple selves to now they're creating avatars of themselves online and offline. Uh, I'll explain to you what I mean. I mean, they are creating all sorts of things where uh, they're a different person no matter which adult they're talking to. 
The next generation will be somebody different as an athlete or a student or a friend. Or do they listen to country music or Christian music or are they a cross country runner? What, I mean, all this list of things. And this is this is just my son who I'm talking about here. Uh, when he was in high school, he's just trying on different selves to figure out what to do and who to be. And this is why two teachers can be in the teacher's lounge together and talk about one student. And one one teacher goes, oh, man, they're the best student I've ever had. And the other, the other teacher will go, really? Because that's not my experience with them. And it's because these students, because they're living in the underground world, try just trying to survive and not believing that most adults uh, they can trust because they think there's an agenda put on them. They need to perform, right? They need to get the right grades, right goals, whatever. And so they're escaping and, and they're developmentally trying on different things. And it's it's not just in different roles. They are a different person online or a different person with Snapchat than they are on Instagram, than they are on Facebook, than they are on TikTok. They're, they're a different person. And uh, it's a little bit scary and when we say things like, hey, you're not being yourself, you're not being the way you normally are, they're intuitively thinking to themselves, I don't even know who I am. I'm still trying to figure it out. So how can you say that I'm not being my normal self when I don't even know who I am? This is part of the identity, autonomy, and belonging that students are working through. Adolescents developed a reflation of selves that vary in function of social context. These include self with father and mother and close friend and romantic partner peers, as well as self and the role of student on the job as an athlete. The critical development task of adolescence, therefore, is the construction of multiple selves in different roles and relationships. This is a normal part of their developmental process today. Another result is the successful kids, I put it in quotes, learn to adapt. So the kids that we think are the most mature, they're the ones that really get it. Man, they're they're acting like adults. They're being very responsible. They get good grades. Listen, friends, as I mentioned in the first session, don't be tricked into thinking that their, their physical appearance and some of the good work they're doing is means that they fully arrived and they're an adult. They're not. They've not had the life experiences that adult has. They have not experienced what, what it means to be an adult. They don't have a frontal lobe developed yet in their brain. And so we get tricked into thinking those successful kids are, uh, well, they're really, really mature. Successful students uh, devise various ways to stay ahead of their peers and to please those in power positions. Unsuccessful students are a variety of reasons we're not as adept at playing the survival game. So this is why some students, you go, man, they're carrying on adult conversations and they're so mature and they're getting great grades and all these things. And just don't be fooled. Don't be fooled into believing that they're fully an adult yet. They just, they literally, physically, psychosocially have not arrived yet. So be, don't be tricked. Don't be fooled. Just pay attention. So they're living in these this mosaic of of things where they're choosing a different tile to figure out who they are and, and living in a different avatar world. And if we're not careful, this is a house of cards ready to fall down when they graduate from high school. If their faith foundation, if they weren't loved for just who they are as a human being, not based on performance and goals, if we don't recognize that they fully haven't become an adult yet, we are setting them up to fail. And the statistics are true. Most high school students who grew up in a good home, good youth ministry, good Bible-believing, gospel-centered church are not hanging on to their faith because they didn't have the foundation and the love and the care that they needed from multiple adults surrounding them. Another result is friendships have changed. <clears throat> friendships have changed. This is really interesting. Friendships have changed. <clears throat> they, they've moved from cliques to clusters. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, went to high school in that time, you had cliques. And the way the cliques worked is, you know, the, the band members were a group and the athletes were a group and the basketball players were a group. And we used to call them stoners on the corner at lunchtime were a group. And there's all these subcultures of groups and none of them intermixed. The band members did not play well with the athletes that didn't play well with the with the uh, people on the on the corner at lunchtime. But now today they're clusters. 
it's clusters of friendships that would have each other's backs no matter what. It's the it's a band member and an athlete and the person on the corner and every you know it can be this diverse group of people and the only thing they have in common is hey I've got your back I can trust you you trust me awesome let's be friends. It, it's moved from in the 1970s 80s cliques were formed around activities sports clubs academics today clusters are formed around mutual self protection. They're more gang like. They're more of a, a group of people that I've got your back, you've got mine, no matter what. And even if those adults don't understand me, you do, you've got me. And so it's moved from the movie Greece of the past, remember that movie, over to Hunger Games. It's moved from, you remember Greece where Sandy was kind of out of place and 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 Danny was kind of out of place and Danny was with the leather jackets and and Sandy is trying to be connected with the pink jackets and and they've got their things, but Danny even tried to be an athlete. That didn't work out very well. And then, the, I mean, the crux of the issue of the movie is is kind of this clash of, of friendships coming together, but everybody had their spaces. Now today, Hunger Games, the only thing they have in common is I've got your back, you've got mine. So we survive this game that we're trying to get through so we don't die. And that's really the way adolescents feel today. They intuitively surround themselves with people that I've got your back, you've got mine, so we can get through this thing called adolescence. I can figure out my identity. I can figure out the power and control that I have in my life autonomy, and I can figure out that people love me for me. And this friends group, you seem to do that for me. Another result is the more freedoms, dangers, anxiety is off the charts. You probably know this and and you've experienced it and you, you see that, boy, whether it's sexual morality and, and sex and different things, drinking, drugs, anxiety, and so they self-harm themselves. And it, the freedoms and dangers are are more than ever before a real issue that we need to deal with. And that's why anxiety is so high. And, and the way they deal with those things, they don't have the tools that they need in order to do so. It's things we need to pay attention to. Young people who are strengthened are, in a word, egocentric. Though not necessarily conceited or prideful, they have little opportunity to consider the needs and interests of others. In other words, it's just developmental. They're just working through this, trying to get in survival mode, living in the underground world, just trying to get through. So how can we help? How can we help? We can build scaffolding of relationships, a scaffolding around a building to repair it, to help it. We can do that with relationships. We ought to as adults, as, as parents, coaches, teachers, pastors, youth pastors, we ought to come alongside of them and surround them with as many Christ-following adults as we possibly can. As I mentioned before, they might go to another adult before you, the older they get. And that's a great thing if they go to the right adult. And we can play a part way early in their life to surround them with adults that we trust, that we ask, hey, would you speak into my child's life? Would you not just mentor them, but be available to them? Set up a scaffolding of relationships for them. Number two is add more Christ-following adults in kids' lives. This kind of adds to the first one, but I want to give you a target. Can you find five Christ-following adults to surround your child right now, no matter how old they are? Five other Christ following adults, if the if it's the whole family, great, but choose five. Who are the five people that you would trust to speak into your child's life, to steer them towards Jesus, to help them along on the on the path of life? Number three, healthy brain development is healthy attachment. There used to be a day when your brain development kept up with your healthy body. And, and so they were on track. And so in the 70s and 80s, when you were ready to launch and be an adult at 18 years old, your brain was moving at the same speed as your development of your body. We know now that adolescence is getting longer and brain development is not keeping up with physical development. But we know that a healthy brain development is closely connected to, to healthy attachment with moms and dads. The more connected you are to your child, the more invested you are in loving them for who they are and not based on performance. We know from research that their brain will develop faster and healthier as a result. You know, 
it takes a whole community to raise a healthy Jesus following kid. And we need to surround them. And that's what the church is for, to surround our kids. But parents, you need to give other parents permission to be in your kids' lives. So what's the role of parents? Well, in, in a general overview, and I've provided this in detail in my book, Parenting, uh, which you can you can grab on Amazon that goes along with this class, is the parenting role from zero to four is you, you want to delight in your child, just delight in them. Just help them. They're they're just they're just delighting in the world. They're just the eyes wide open, just experiencing things and and love in the world. From K through fifth grade, they're discovering. They're discovering who they are. They're discovering the world. They're discovering what their gifts are. They're discovering what their abilities are, and we need to help that. And ages from sixth to eighth grade, they're making decisions. They're deciding about their friendships that are going to set them up for high school. They're going to decide about their faith, and so we want to help them along in that. In ninth and 12th grade, we, they're dr being driven. Literally, they're driving their own car eventually and driving a car at 16 when they get their license, but they're they're driven, they're they're driving, they're they're trying to figure out life purpose and where they're going and what do I do after high school? And then post high school is we ought to come alongside and just help them develop more because they're trying to develop more, whether it's schooling, college, military, taking a gap year, whatever it might be. We want to come alongside and, and develop them. You also notice I've given you seasons of life from Sherpa. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And you move from Sherpa to rabbi and from rabbi to sage. And I'll talk about those. So parenting in seasons, this is what I'm talking about with these three different groups. Parenting in the seasons, when, when, a, when a child is from about zero to 10 years, you're kind of a Sherpa. You know, you're hauling things, you're picking up their shoes, they're grabbing their backpack, you're you're taking something to school they forgot. You're you're just kind of a Sherpa. You're along for the ride, just carrying their things along. And you're trying to help them get responsible and do that. But you're you're really kind of just a Sherpa. And then you make a transition to like 11 through 18, junior high, or maybe a little upper elementary into high school. You're kind of a rabbi. And rabbis teach them things. Rabbis teach them the Bible. Rabbis lean in. More is caught oftentimes, so we need to show and tell. We need to show them what it means to follow after Jesus ourselves, not perfectly. We're going to say I'm sorry a lot. We're going to lean in like a rabbi. We're going to we're going to do a lot of teaching in this season. And then afterwards, 18 plus, you eventually get around to this season, trust me, where you become a sage. I've started to see it, a couple of glimmers of hope in my two oldest kids, uh, mainly my oldest, and then and then my second oldest, 24 and 21. And and now it's like now they're leaning in and coming to you for things. And you kind of wait for them to come to you now. And you're sort of a sage because they're realizing because their frontal lobe is developed. And now they're understanding abstract thinking and all those things that go with it. They're starting to come to you and ask you for advice about life things. And it's a beautiful thing when that starts to happen. So each one of these seasons, I give practical tips for zero to four-year-olds and delight. I go into more detail in my book on parenting, and I'm not going to read all of these for you. You can push pause anytime and read them through if you need to. But here are some practical tips in each stage of life, K through fifth grade here, and what we ought to be about and ultimately have to help them trust Jesus and experience the church community in this stage. Making the transition right here, you can notice in the right-hand corner from Sherpa to rabbi. And then from sixth to eighth grade, here's some ideas that you can grab hold of. And we want them to grab hold of Jesus and we want them to grab hold of the local church. Ninth through twelfth grade, the same. And as you make this move from rabbi to Sherpa, I'm sorry, rabbi to sage, <clears throat> moving out of high school. You can write these things down or pause the video and take a look at them. And then post high school, how to develop, how to keep coming alongside and cheering them on and being a coach and, and eventually being a sage they come back to. So friends, let me lean in with cell phones and technology for just a second on this video. I go into more detail in the book, Parenting as well, but th this is a really big deal. Um, cell phones and technology are changing the landscape. They're changing the way we interact with the next generation. They're changing the way they're developing, their frontal lobe, their brains are developing, and psychosocially how they're developing. 
they're 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 living their lives as avatars online, as I mentioned, and they're communicating with one another more in texting and Snapchat and other ways. And this is part of the difficulty of why some of the next generation, particularly adolescents, can't carry on a conversation with an adult. And let me remind you, just because they can, just because you're like, wow, they're so impressive. They're they're carrying on a conversation. They're having an adult conversation. Don't be tricked into thinking that they developmentally are an adult yet. They're not. They're not. They can't take on the same responsibilities and their brain development is not there yet. So don't be tricked. That's a good sign. That's great. But they might just be playing the game to get by, to satisfy the performance they think you are wanting them to give them. It's so important they understand this. And so we need to communicate. This is the key. This is the key. Parents over communicate from the time your kids are third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way through high school and beyond. Over communicate with them and communicate in their language. Listen, I am on all the social media with my kids. We're in groups with them. We're on Snapchat as a family group. We're in Instagram with one another. We're on TikTok with one another. We send each other videos and nonsense and different things. I'm going into their underground world to connect with them. And it's so important for you to maintain communication and negotiate expectations with your kids. That's the key to this whole area. And you can set up boundaries and margins and how much time they're on their phones and all those things. That's fine. You can navigate that, figure that out. But in the meantime, you need to communicate in overdrive with your kids. Be available to them. Talk to them. By the way, that picture up in the upper left-hand corner is the first iPhone. I just had to toss that in there. Middle schoolers, uh, a middle school removes bathroom mirrors to help stop kids from making TikToks. True story in North Carolina, a middle school administration saw that mainly girls were going into the bathroom and making TikTok videos, looking into the mirror, just like that girl is. And they decided to take the mirrors out of the bathrooms and that way, and all of a sudden now they stop going to the bathroom as often. Uh, everything is changing because of social media, because of smartphones. I read one psychologist that said, uh, there's there's no reason for adolescents to be on social media uh, before 16 years old. There's, there's no reason for them to be on social media before 16 years old. Um, and the same psychologist advocates for uh, schools being a no phone zone. And I love that. Maybe your child is at a school that's like that, but that requires all the parents, all the administration to be on the same page because why do you need your phone at school? Why do you need your phone at school? You, you don't need it. You, you have all the other technology that you need and you don't need to do that. So that's just an idea for you to kick around and talk to some other parents about an administration, the school you go to. But um, man, YouTube and TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, those are the big ones right now, but it's going to change. There's going to be new apps that come out for the next generation. So I love this sign that showed up in a lot of coffee shops. We do not have Wi-Fi. Talk to each other. Pretend like it's 1995. I love that. I love that. Like put your phones down, have a relationship face-to-face, -face, be present, um, this is so hard and I don't do a very good job with this, but like put your phone away at mealtime, put your phone away when you're, so you're fully present with your kids um, and ask them to do the same. Uh, that would be a good place to start too with communication. So what's the goal of parenting? Well, to love in such a way that your child is convinced that they are fully capable of making a positive impact in the world for Jesus. That's a mouthful, but man, to love in such a way, unconditionally, no conditions, not because of your performance or your grades, goals or grades, but love in such a way that, man, you can make a positive impact for Jesus in the world. That would be the ultimate goal for all of parenting. Here's a review of what we talked about, our role in the seasons and our role during the age groups. Why all this matters, and I'm almost done with session two, for the church and for us. Let me review. This is the tightrope of adolescence. There's a maternal attachment over here as a child grows up, mainly zero to 10 years old. There has to be a paternal attachment during adolescence. That means dads, 
you need to lean in during adolescence. You know, there's a study out there and uh, multiple studies now. I looked it up just today to make sure I had my facts right. There are multiple studies that that show that a girl hits her puberty later on when they have a close attachment to their dad before adolescence and through adolescence. Let me say that again. The closer the relationship is to a dad in a healthy, stable family that delays a girl starting her puberty. So think about this. It gets it back closer to where it was in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s, where it wouldn't be as low as 9, 10, 11 years old when a girl hits puberty, but it would it would lean towards 13, 14 years old. That's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because it expresses the health of a paternal attachment with a, particularly a daughter, but it's true of a son as well. But research is showing that the closer a dad is, to their preteen and heading into adolescence, the better it is, the healthier it is, the and it, and, it, and it causes them to mature faster in all the right ways. And then we want them to have this heavenly father attachment and interdependence, remember, to church community attachment. I love, uh, if there's family stability there, it helps uh, uh, an awful lot. And if you don't have the family stability like you wish you did, then surround them with other Christ-following adults. I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. He says, I was gentle among you, like a mother. He uses that metaphor to the church. I was, I was like a mother being gentle. It's like a mother in the maternal attachment. And then he transitions and he says, and I, I encourage you, comfort you, and urge you to live right like a father, he goes on to say. So that's, that's like a, the paternal attachment. And we want to ultimately come alongside, and Paul says in Philippians to that church in Philippi, he wants to come alongside of them. That's what we want to do is as you're merging into being a sage, you just want to come alongside. Or another word is you want to coach, but you want to be invited in. And we want to trust communication, closeness is our goal through this whole process. So as they're going through adolescence, we can surround them with a net, a safety net, so if things go bad, we, they've been surrounded by a maternal, paternal, heavenly father, the church coming alongside. And then ultimately, we want to converge and we want to have congruence. We want to all converge on the next generation and we want congruence sending the same message to them so they can be supported. It's going to require the church, friends, coaches, caring adults, teachers coming alongside together to reach the next generation and to help them have a firm foundation in their relationship with Jesus as we understand developmentally where they are to come out the other side. So remember, here's the big picture. Grace brings them home. We want to be in control. We want to be snowplow parents. We want to be helicopter parents. We want to, out of fear and anxiety, we want to control them. But the reality is grace brings them home every time. Think long-term. Think marathon, not sprint. You want to have a relationship with your child the rest of your life. So set it up that way today, no matter how old they are, whether they're very young or heading into adolescence or they're in adolescence or they're just past, do some, do some hard work. You might need to apologize. You might need to say, I'm sorry. I've missed the mark here and there. So you can come alongside them down the road. This is what it's all about. And I hope all of this has been very, very helpful for you. This is couple of my favorite verses to leave you with as I end this session. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your mighty deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. At the end of the day, all we have is to, to share how faithful God has been in the past and how faithful God's going to be in the future, understanding the foundation we want to lay, understanding where the next generation is these days. Um, we, need, we need to have a, a realistic view. I told you in the first session, we need to have a, a proper diagnosis so we can have the right prescription. So hopefully this has given you a diagnosis of what's going on. So now you can take it 
and prescribe the right steps forward. Even if, even if you stumble and make mistakes as a parent, coach, teacher, administrator, we're doing the best we can to come alongside the next generation so that they will hang on to this great God who has done so much faithfulness in the past, and he will be faithful in the future. Hope this has been great and very helpful for you. Thanks for tuning in to session two. Again, if you missed session one, go back and look at that. But I hope this is helpful. And I'm praying for you as you come alongside the next generation, your own children, your own students, your own athletes to make a difference in their lives. Thanks again for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at the contact information I've provided. Blessings to you. Take care.